Hello friend, how are you? I'm doing okay, thanks for asking. I'm so glad to welcome you into the safe place. It's a place of inclusivity and safety for any conversation to be heard. The safe place began as a image in my head of a wooden cabin on the lake. My own place of mental safety. And I welcome you here to listen in to discussions on mental and physical health mental illness and mental and physical disability. You may hear stories that inspire. You may hear stories that make you cry, both in sadness and happiness. But always told from a place of truth. For we hold dear the principles of love, kindness and compassion. Now, with that all said, it's time to hunker down, get comfortable, as we're ready to welcome you into a safe place. Well, good afternoon, Brooke. So thank you very much for coming on today and uh, joining us in the in the safe place. Um, I'm going to literally pass straight over to you um, today and let you introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah um it's partly why i do it if i'm honest because <laughs> uh, you get some really interesting answers as well um is, is what i've kind of found um and I'm I, I'm I'm the same. I I will usually give the headline and miss the kind of stuff that I probably should have spoken about. <laughs> um, but that's that's all good. That's all good. Um, so adaptive athlete. Then what what is an adaptive athlete? Yeah. Yeah. So how how long have you been doing it for then? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm. Yeah. 
And so, and what did you do at uni? Were you were you a a, a true academic type, or or was sports? New? Yeah. Yeah. I did history, um, just just straight history for my first degree, and it was very similar in that I did it just because I liked it. That was as simple as that. Mm. yeah i would i would wholeheartedly agree i mean i i will now so i'm starting my what, third time at uni um next Next week or the week after, I am a bit of a geek. I say a bit of a geek. I am a full-on geek, nerd, whatever you want to describe it as. Um, <laughs> for, for all my, uh, for for all my, I kind of, I love sport and I love everything else, but I, I just love learning. It's just something that I've always, always enjoyed. Um, but my first one was was history, and I, I did it because I liked it. Simple as that. I, I wasn't thinking about. The future, because you know, you've, when you're when you're deciding, you're what seventeen, really. But you can also put it right back to GCSEs, because actually, you need to know what A level subjects to do for your your degree. If you, if that's the route you go down, and I didn't have a clue, I really didn't at all. Um, probably looking back, had some inclinations over what I. Would kind of like to do, but didn't want to tell anybody about it at that at that age because I thought it might sound silly. Um, and then I I then went back and did law because I thought that was then what I wanted to do. Turns out really boring. <laughs> um, yeah, learned that <laughs> took took a lot of money and and uh, a lot of time at uni, but I learned that one. Um, and now I'm going back to do psychology, and and that is probably where. I should have gone in my first degree, uh, and and I would have got a lot more out of of doing it, and um, and yeah, would have got more of a more of a career kind of focus, I would say. Um, but yeah, it is it is hard. Um, so it, like, obviously, you came out of uni, um, and did you? So you're a hockey player. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Wow.
<laughs> yeah, I think anybody that has that has tried CrossFit. I mean, I I I am not fit at the moment at all. Um, cause I, I I had surgery earlier this year, so I'm still kind of in recovery phase. But I remember trying CrossFit for the first time, and I genuinely thought I was having a heart attack. And I was just, and, I, and that was me, not quite at peak fitness because I I I was going through a bit of an injury phase, but I was I was reasonably fit for me, and I I was just dying, absolutely dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's a, it's another level of of kind of social interaction, I think, with with cross. I mean, I, I've been I've been going to the gym for well, since I was like sixteen because I was a rugby player when I was younger. Um, so I was obviously having to work out as part of that. Um, played a bit of rugby during uni as well. So obviously, mixture of drinking and and working out, um, and and doing really ridiculous things that. I will never speak of because um, that's what you do as a rugby boy. <laughs> um, so I've, I've always done it, but it's just, it's a different dynamic being in that kind of circle of people that are so involved in that specific type of fitness. Like even, even in rugby, I didn't find it was as close to that kind of community as, as I've seen it in, in boxes. Um, is that is that something that you find as well with kind of like comparing hockey to? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will also say that the one thing that I found in particular with CrossFit is that if you if you don't do it properly, it's an injury waiting to happen. 
have you experienced that kind of side of it? Particularly with being adaptive, adaptive, because obviously you've got a you've got a different dynamic there. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think it's where it's the kind of it's the amazing part of CrossFit, and it's also the bit that you could get caught out by if you don't have one a really good coach. And and I think the, certainly that's something again that that I've seen in in the few different boxes that I've been to is that the where you've got really good coaches, you you go you see people go through the fundamentals first. Before they before they even think about doing what we would term as CrossFit, and I think sometimes that bit's missed out, or or at least you don't do enough of that, which is then opening up the injuries, and then you you know once enough people get injured, it's it's the kind of thing that it becomes known for, isn't it? But as you say, it's it's you're doing a lot of reps, so if you don't do it properly, you're going to bloody hurt yourself. You do, yeah, then you won't. It seems so simple. Uh, do you find that through different kind of points in your life, so you've been doing it for what, 18 months, two years now overall, obviously with the, the kind of COVID influence. And have you found that at different points of your life, you've kind of used it more as a, as a, almost as a kind of mental health escape? Because again, that's something that I've observed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I could just, I've just got this mental image of you just beaming, almost like a cartoonish beam um, whilst you were doing it. <laughs> It's it, it's a that kind of recovery thing is a it's a difficult one because I mean I mean I'm I, I was born with my condition so I lower limb is is my issue so I've got basically very knackered ankles and that's just yeah that's just life um, and it's I was I was chatting to one of my kind of former gym partners not not too long ago because so he's just injured his back. Um, and it's like the first time he's ever hurt himself, like not been able to kind of do any any real training because it's just he just can't. Yeah. Whereas I'm like an old hat at, <laughs> at injuries, uh, having to have time off, and all that sort of stuff. Because sometimes I, I mean, I, sometimes I can't walk. So if I can't walk, I, I tend not to be able to do the sort of workouts that I enjoy doing because I I tend to like. lifting big heavy things and um that's probably the, the thing that i've found most difficult actually is that adjustment to not now being allowed to lift big heavy things um which is a which is a kind of strange dynamic but i think if you've not experienced that before i i do think it's more difficult to then figure out how to kind of get through that and get around that And somebody that's kind of lived that throughout their entire life, and I think that's where, particularly, particularly people in the disability community have almost the kind of almost the the answers to people that haven't been through stuff. So, you know, it's it's a powerful thing that you learn as you grow up if you're constantly having to adapt to everybody and everything else. Whereas if you'd never had to do that, you haven't got that skill set. Hmm.
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, or, or you just do it on autopilot. You just it's just a natural thing that you go through. Um you just as you as you very eloquently put, that you are just better at it by um by living it throughout well, your entire life. Yeah. And it's it's a bit like I mean I I I never used to refer to myself as being disabled. So when I was growing up, it wasn't something that I ever ever thought about or or kind of labelled myself as, even though what's going on with me now is exactly the same as when I was 10, 13, whatever. It's the same thing. It's just some of it's slightly worse because, you know, you get older and things get a bit worse, just the way it is. But it's the same. and I look the same, apart from now I use mobility aids to get around rather than um, being able to get around on my, my own two feet, as it were. Um and I, I kind of had this, almost like this moment, not to put it too highbrow, but in that I, I was kind of thinking the other day that it's not actually that I haven't ever thought of myself as disabled. It's that I was never in the position where I was having to actively kind of push through a world where I couldn't get around it. So as an example... I've I now do term myself as disabled because I'm disabled in the sense of that if I go down to Solcombe, which is we're actually going this weekend, um, and it's hills, it's steps galore, it's all that sort of stuff, and it's it's the kind of the premise that it's it's the world that becomes disabling for the individual rather than the individual has become disabled. Uh, is that something that you've kind of found through through the podcast and, and through your, your own lived experience? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Yeah. And and even even just the fact of that you can have a normal life, whatever normal is, because quite frankly, there isn't such a thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I regularly, regularly do. <laughs> um, no, it, it it really is because I mean, if you think about what what normal is meant to be, it's the it's a majority effectively. Okay, so where in the UK have you got a majority of anything? There just isn't, because the whole, everybody has got something going on in a different way because of their, their own experiences, their own background, their own life story, and that could be some amazing stuff. It could be super privileged, you know, fantastic lives and all that sort of stuff, and, you know, yay. Um, or it could be the the other end of the spectrum where it's it's really not it's really really difficult it's it's living in poverty or it's um having to deal with a world that's not designed um for you and it's it it, it kind of it frustrates me the the kind of whole conversation around um what disability is because we've been having a lot of that at, at work recently but also the kind of representation side. So I, I'm actually doing a piece at work at the moment. Um, it's my last week in, in the in the firm that I work for at the moment. So I, I work in banking, uh, which has got nothing to do with my degrees, but, you know. <laughs> um, so I work, work, work in banking um, for, a, for a big bank, and I'm effectively leaving because... I don't feel like there is any growth opportunity in what is a huge blue chip company. Which there should be growth opportunity in. And one of the prime reasons for that is that if you look at senior management, there is nobody apart from one person who's in a very niche area. Um, there's no one that is anything like me. Nobody that's got um, any, certainly any either visible or that they talk about disability. Um, and even just, you know, background wise, it's it's just a very atypical, you know, think of a banker in your mind and, and that, <laughs> that's, what, that's what there is kind of thing. And if you don't fit that mold or if you don't have those people to look up to and to go, well, actually, they've done it. So that means that I can probably do it too. Um, it, it's a really, a really big and important thing. Um, something that I think we need to do a lot more on. Um, and I think, I think there's things that have done really well. So like the Paralympic Games, particularly the the 2012, yeah, 12, because um, it's 10 years, isn't it? Um, games, I think, did a lot for for allowing there to be more disabled people on TV, um, as an example. 
and uh, have you seen that in in the kind of CrossFit world as well with the adapt? Because there seems to be a lot more that going that's going on now than there was. Is that fair to say? Yeah, same. Mm. And 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 what in terms of in terms of actually allowing that change to happen because I think I think it is a case of allowing it to happen rather than forcing it to happen. Um, what do you see as the best method for for kind of helping that change along? Unless you just run over some toes, that's always a good one. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I'm a I'm a part time wheelchair user. Um, basically, 
when I can't get around on crutches, I'll, I'll, I'll use a chair instead. Um, and it's, I mean, I, my crutches are, are bright orange, like, you know, same kind of orange as the, the t shirt that, that I'm wearing, which people listening won't be able to see, but it's a very bright orange. Um, <laughs> and I think probably the last, maybe the last three months, um, as, I've, as I've been using them everywhere. I've really noticed the difference in when I use even one stick compared to two sticks and when I'm using two sticks compared to being in a chair and the different attitudes that, that people have. Um, and also the kind of the way that parents actually in particular are with their kids when they ask questions. You, you can kind of hear the questions be asked and, you know, it's normal for a, a kid to be, be inquisitive and it's actually, it's great in my view for kids to be inquisitive and to, to be asking about different people and, and trying to understand that. But then so often the, the parent will just go, oh, well, they've just hurt themselves. Particularly when I'm on crutches, it's, oh, they, they, they must have hurt their ankle or must have hurt their foot or it's like they, they don't even think about, well, actually, it's because they, they need the the sticks to get around and to, to be able to, to walk and, and, and move like you and I, um, or in a, in a chair, it's the same. In that sense, it's that, oh, well, they're, 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 um, they're not able to use the legs, is, is the one that I often hear. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was in a bit of prep for a meeting I've got um, next week, I was looking at the kind of stats that sit around this. And um, within the workplace context, so you've got to take that into mind, um, roughly 45% of people, so non-disabled people this is, um, feel uncomfortable using the word disabled or a version or disability. They feel uncomfortable using it, which I just think is... And uh, uh, frankly, a madness. Right? It's a word. <laughs> but then at the same time, I've probably been that person. Because I, if, as I was saying before, I, I didn't think of myself as disabled. And it was probably actually I didn't want to label myself as disabled because I thought it was going to only have negative impacts there probably is some in reality uh, in fact there almost definitely is some um but equally it's opened up a, a kind of a different world to me that i kind of wish that i'd known more of um and <sighs> yeah
Mm. Yeah. And it's a, it's a little bit like I, I remember. I distinctly remember going up, up to um, a friend's uh, birthday party uh, at university, and it was a kind of fairly kind of backward town. I won't name it because it's not really appropriate to. Um, but we within our group of friends, because it was it was a, a normal university. There was um, a guy that had very poor sight. Um, so, um, it had a degenerative condition. There was a, uh, a black guy and an Asian guy. Um, and then there were everyone else in there, just, you know, normal, um, normal kind of world. And no one reacted to the blind guy at all, um, or visibly, um, impaired guy. Um, but the looks that the um, Asian guy got were slightly worrying. But then the questions that the black guy got were extremely worrying. And it was because they just didn't have anybody from the black community or anybody from the Asian community in, in their location. They just hadn't come across those people. And it's the same kind of context for people with disability if you don't see it, if you don't know people that have got it, if you don't see them on TV, like the brilliant last leg, but also if you see people on TV that are playing a disabled um, um, kind of person, that it's, I'm not entirely sure where I, whether I like that or don't like that at the moment. Um, you have watched The Good Doctor. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. And that's, that's the one that probably causes me most difficulty because as a TV show, if I forget that the guy that plays the autistic doctor um, isn't autistic. So if I forget that, which actually you could argue he's not, he, he portrays it reasonably well, although it's a very big spectrum, so you, you don't really know. Um, it's, a, it's a really good show. It's probably a little bit worse than, in the later series than the, than the earlier ones, but that happens but then as soon as I remember that the actor isn't autistic it just really winds me up it's it's just really frustrating because that could have been somebody that um could have played that role with lived experience and made sure it was you know the best representation of of that as as possible why do you think that doesn't happen? Mm hmm. Mm
Ja. Well, it's it's something that I've seen bizarrely more in. Um, so I, I I like games. I used I used to work for game the the game store um, many many years ago. Um, and there's a game that I started playing recently, which is called Saint Saints Row, which is a, a horrific game really in, in that it's gang gang violence and yeah just. shooting and all that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. put, put that to a side for a second. One of the really interesting things that, that I've seen with it, though, is that when you're designing your character, which is one of the first things you do, um, you can design them with uh, prosthetic legs, uh, single or, or double um, arms. There's no wheelchair, which you could argue isn't, isn't quite as good as it could be, but... it probably wouldn't fit the game in, in that sense. So I can kind of see the, the the rationale behind it. But like you, that's, I think, the first time that I've seen that um, in any game where you can actually have yourself not entirely represented, but much closer uh, to representation than, than before. Yeah. It's like, I mean, they're not, not going to have the main character with crutches like me, as an example. Because, that, although that, actually, that would be quite a good weapon. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it, it's it's a step in the right direction. And I think there's there does seem to be that desire from certain pockets to do that. Uh, I mean, social media is, although I would argue they really haven't got it right yet, um, is another one where. You know the little uh, emoji characters that you can now make on Facebook and, and Instagram. Um, so I tried to make one uh, and couldn't couldn't add crutches, so couldn't do that. Um, but also I couldn't for some reason I can't put myself in a wheelchair, whereas other people can. And it's like that kind of like you say that sixty percent. It's like they're they're trying, but just not quite getting there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, of course. It's only 20% of the population within the UK, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 20, 20, roughly 20%. One in five. Obviously, that is slanted as um, as you get older. So there's a greater population above 70 that are disabled compared to below 70, which, again, goes back to the point that anybody... 
can and potentially will become disabled at some point in their in their lives but that's a big old proportion of the of the population to just miss out it's just slightly sickening really um in many ways there is and, and, and that one of the things that i do a lot of these days um is trying to unleash that that kind of un, untapped potential um and i think that's where there's some advantages to working for big organizations because I mean, if i think about the organizations that i tend to work with they're uh, usually minimum of ten thousand plus employees so within that population you know you've got you've got uh, in theory because it I mean, obviously the practice is probably slightly different, but you've got a couple of thousand worth of of um, disabled people that you can help um, and kind of help improve things for, which is which is definitely a, a kind of real positive. Um, but equally, they don't move that quickly, <laughs> so it can be quite slow and and um, and frustrating. Um, so just what wanted to. I'm conscious that we're we're kind of getting to to around the hour point, but I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the the podcast and and how how and why really you started it. Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell as you talk about it that that you've got a real a real passion um for it, which which I think is a lovely a lovely thing just to be able to to have as much as anything else. Um because it's very easy not to or to end up being in something that you you're probably not as passionate about. So so getting that um it's a big win, I would say.
Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I would I would agree. Amazing. I, I must admit, I, I I started this one for for similar reasons. It was mental illness that, that I started this one for, um, in particular men's um, mental illness. So I I have lived with depression, which I now know for about thirty years ish, um, with you know kind of varying varying scales as as it as it that's just how depression often is. Um, and again, it was the representation side of things. Like I just, I wasn't hearing people talk about it in particular. I wasn't hearing real stories being shared. Um, and it was that thought exactly like you of, well, if, if by either me sharing my own personal story or having guests on that share theirs, um, and then by having different people on that will be able to share different dynamics, if that helps just one person to talk about it themselves or feel less alone, then that's a huge win, a huge, huge win. So two things I always ask my guests before, um, before we wrap up. Um, one, thinking back to your five-year-old self, what bit of advice would you give? And why? Amazing. And a good bit of advice too. Some, some... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, amazing. Just just in case you forget, of course. And um the other question is a bit of a two parter. So for a for a moment, imagine that I am literally the world's best chef or home cook or whatever. Um and it was dinner party. What 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 would the food be? What what would you have me cook? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And in terms of people at the table so um we'll say there's four other chairs there um that are currently vacant who are you going to have yeah yeah Mm. 
Nej. <laughs> Ideal for driving. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? How come? I was going to say, like even Claudia, I think is is quite a quite a funny person. Um, but I love the fact that you went for Billy Connolly. Yeah. I kind of grew up on Billy Connolly. Same. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I completely agree. Say same. I, I, in fact, most of my family is still still up in um, up in Glasgow. Um, I mean, I, I was born up north, but moved down here when I was like four. Um, which I must admit, I'm still still a bit gutted about. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, it's fine. I won't hold grudges. Um, but there is just something about that Scottish humour um, that is just a, another level. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Noel Fielding as well. I mean, he, he's a really. I'm, I'm not a massive fan of him on Bake Off, particularly. But I love his um, kind of TV programs where you know the really out there stuff that he's done, My, Mighty Bush and stuff like. It's just so far out there that it can't not be funny. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, you, you surround yourself with like-minded people, isn't that what they say? Yeah. Well, look, Brooke, thank you so much for coming on. It, it's been a really, a really wonderful discussion. Um, I really enjoyed that, and I'm sure, I'm sure listeners will too. Um, I always uh, send people away with uh, love, kindness, and compassion. So I'll send that your way too. No worries. Well, thank you, friends. That's all we've got time for today. I'm sure you have enjoyed uh, today's episode. And if you did, please make sure you rate uh, the episode and the show's five stars on whatever platform you might be listening on and of course please share your own stories and your own um, kind of th thoughts and feelings of the episodes in the reviews you can also find me um, on I am Gavin Clark and that's Clark with an E over on Instagram and you can search for the safe place uh, on there too it's a safe place podcast but for now I'll send you away with love kindness and compassion Speak soon.